folks. Um, just a quick introduction to Mike. Um, most of you know Mike uh, pretty well. Mike's an anthropologist. He did his undergrad at Melbourne University uh, some time ago. He's uh, been working in the Philippines and China, uh, particularly on trade and uh, commodity chains. Mike speaks fluent Tagalog and Mandarin. Um, he's been publishing up a storm. Um, We've, uh, I've had uh, the privilege to be a co-author with Mike on a, um, an article that we're very excited about, which is in socially, uh, on social ecological systems. That's a critique of it. Um, and it's in the uh, Heartland of Social Ecological Systems uh, journal, uh, Ecology and Society. So uh, those of you who are interested in critiques of social ecological systems, I recommend you this paper. Um, it's uh, hot off the press. Uh, so, um, yeah, and I think it, um, it, uh, it's a great example of the power of anthropology uh, in, the, in the very complex arena of uh, resource management uh, in, the, in the coral triangle in the, in the region. Um, so, I highly commend that to you all. And with no further ado, I will let Mike deliver his talk. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, all right, so thanks everyone for coming. So a very prominent global issue in recent years, obviously, has been what's commonly referred to as the rise of China. So since the economic reforms launched by Deng Xiaoping in 1978, uh, the Chinese economy has expanded massively, and so it's now the second largest uh, in the world. Uh, and this has had widespread effects that are increasingly visible around the world today. So you see it in things from Chinese exports, uh, foreign investment, migration, tourism, and so on. Within China, it's seen increasing wealth, urbanisation and the rise of the middle class in Chinese cities uh, and rising levels of consumption is one big feature uh, of this expansion of the Chinese economy and expansion of the middle class. So rapid industrialisation has also generated uh, significant environmental problems though, so, so much so uh, that now China is the, the world's largest producer of uh, carbon emissions. While per capita emissions do remain significantly lower uh, than many other countries, the sheer scale of China's population uh, means that its influence is massive. So within the sector of fisheries and seafood, China's role in global fisheries production, uh, trade and consumption has also become increasingly prominent uh, and it's a progressively conspicuous focus of attention among academics and policy makers. China's now the largest consumer and producer of seafood products in the world. Uh, China alone accounted for 62% world aquaculture production by volume in 2011, 35% uh, of total fish production, and by 2030, China is expected to account for about 40% 40, 40 uh, of global consumption of food fish. So the focus of my fellowship uh, has been to try and make sense of China's increased role in consumption of seafood, uh, and I want to understand the drivers and the effects of this process. So I do this by working uh, with a broad theoretical approach called commodities, commodity studies, sometimes also called commodity chains. Uh, so there's a wide variety uh, of different approaches to commodity studies, but a basic definition of what they have in common is that they take as their object of analysis a particular commodity and track the movement of such commodities from production through exchange networks uh, to the point of consumption. Commodity studies is an interdisciplinary field. It's not a discipline itself, so there's a wide range of social science disciplines that work on commodity studies, so geographers, sociologists, economists and so on, uh, each with differing emphases. Two key debates uh, in the literature and commodity studies uh, are to do with regulation and upgrading. So regulation might refer to, for example, uh, how to improve labour standards among producers, how to ensure product quality uh, along the commodity chain, how to minimise environmental damage by certain commodities and so on. Upgrading typically uh, refers to the efforts of people along the commodity chain uh, to try and improve their position or economically upgrade uh, along the commodity chain. So, for example, from changing from a producer of raw materials uh, to some form of value-added manufacturing and so on, or to obtain a better price. So my disciplinary background is in anthropology, and so an anthropological perspective on commodity studies uh, typically focuses on some of the micro-social and micro-political processes that affect commodity chains. So we look at the context of economic relationships and political relationships. So, for example, the social relationships between producers and governments, for example, uh, or the social relationships between producers and traders, buyers and consumers, uh, and how this social context uh, affects the nature of the commodity chain. And this typically uh, relies on 
uh, quite long-term field work uh, and intensive uh, interview-based data collection. And so hopefully this perspective uh, will become a bit clearer as I go through examples from my presentation. So as a summary of what I'm going to be talking about, uh, firstly I'll focus on what I've been doing for the last two years and then uh, go into more detail uh, about the specific components of the fellowship or the project. So these four components which I've labelled for simplicity as governance, consumption, trade and production. Um, they take place yeah, in two countries, China and uh, the Philippines, so three of them in China and one production in the Philippines. Uh, and then I'll talk about some of my plans uh, for the remaining three years of the fellowship. So quick background to my research in China before uh, talking about the components of governance, consumption and trade in more detail. So I've been physically based in Beijing since March 2013, affiliated with uh, the Department of Sociology at Peking University. I've been working with Professor Liu Nong and his Masters and PhD students, and that's a photo of him there with uh, some of the students. Working in China has had its challenges, uh, many of which are related to the fairly opaque nature uh, of governance in China. So finding out information from official Chinese sources uh, that isn't publicly available uh, can be very difficult. Uh, and there's also political sensitivities over some of this research. So, for example, I had a long, uh, I've had a long relationship with um, a senior researcher from the Chinese Academy of Fishery Sciences who's also very interested in some of these issues to do with consumption and trade, uh, but he's been unable to formally work with me uh, because his institute is pretty closely associated with the government, uh, and so he's been unable to work on uh, projects like this that are potentially critical of uh, China's role. So his institute falls under direct supervision of the government, uh, and so he has to toe the party line a bit more, uh, whereas professors at universities are generally given uh, a bit more latitude. It's also taken uh, a lot of negotiation time uh, to get approvals to work in certain locations like some of the major seafood markets, um, working in Chinese uh, is also an ongoing challenge, uh, but my Chinese has obviously improved a lot uh, since being there. So I'll shift now to the first component uh, of the project, which is governance. Uh, so this component is a relatively small part of the research, and in many ways uh, I did it uh, more to familiarise myself uh, with the governance and policy context in China. So we conducted a literature review of relevant English language and uh, Chinese language academic articles, uh, conducted key informant interviews, uh, with relevant stakeholders, so these include representatives of the major uh, environmental non-government organisations uh, working on marine issues in China, uh, representatives of the major trade associations, uh, and also academics, including those involved uh, with developing government policy. So the rapid growth in the fishery sector in China uh, has come with significant environmental challenges, and these include high levels of fishing uh, in both domestic and international waters, uh, pollution and the high use of fish meal related to the rapid expansion of aquaculture uh, and the trade in and the consumption of unsustainably harvested species. And there's a broad consensus among scholars working on environmental governance in China that while important progress has been made uh, in many areas, uh, there's still many challenges clearly. Uh, so at the broadest level the task has been to reconcile China's drive uh, for economic development uh, and poverty reduction with the need for environmental reform. So the need for economic development usually been the winner in these trade-offs uh, and it's linked uh, to the idea that the broad-based legitimacy of the regime is more closely tied to economic growth than environmental reform. Uh, one key issue is the considerable disjuncture between uh, legislation that's enacted and the rhetoric that's espoused uh, and actual patterns of implementation and enforcement on the ground. So governments at the local level are usually quite linked uh, to the performance of uh, local industries and so this linkage means it's very difficult to enforce environmental regulations, uh, and violations usually see relatively minimal repercussions. There's also powerful historical trajectories of environmental exploitation in China that continue to influence patterns of governance today. Uh, so these have included strong ideologies of modernisation uh, and development that remain in place, uh, and this is closely linked uh, to the so-called four modernisations uh, of agriculture, industry, national defence and science and technology uh, launched by Deng Xiaoping in 1978. That slide, sorry. So in the fishery sector, uh, policy is guided by the 12th five-year plan for fishery development, which I've just simplified as the National Fishery Plan on the slide there. This has got a lot in it, but um, there's just a few features of the plan that I'll focus on. So the first is of uh, principles of balance between the quantity of product produced and uh, the quality uh, of the product, which is a newer emphasis. 
So this shift in emphasis is related to at least two major factors. Uh, firstly, the growing middle class has led to change in food consumption patterns more broadly across China uh, and a stronger demand uh, for higher quality product. Secondly, the significant incidence of food safety scandals uh, over the past few years has led to widespread mistrust of the Chinese food system. Uh, scandals have included uh, scandals as well in the, the seafood sector, such as high use of antibiotics in agriculture. Uh, and I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail uh, in relation to consumption later. So the regulation of food safety uh, in China in aquaculture is typically operated in effect as two systems. So one for the international export market, uh, with higher regulatory standards designed to meet um, the requirements in the boarding countries, uh, and the other for the domestic market, uh, so with lower regulatory standards. And the government is facing uh, increasing domestic pressure uh, to improve the domestic food safety system. Another notable point in the five-year plan is the emphasis on aquaculture, which is in part simply due to the sheer scale of aquaculture in China. Much of this aquaculture is focused on relatively low trophic level species, so with regard to finfish, for example, aquaculture is dominated uh, by the production of carp for the domestic market and tilapia for the export market. So many inefficiencies in farming do exist, though, uh, and the demand for higher trophic level species with a subsequent greater demand for fish meal uh, is likely to continue to expand. Other well-documented environmental concerns uh, with the aquaculture sector in China include pollution and uh, uses of antibiotics. Third point I'll focus on for the plan is increasing levels of support for the Chinese distant water fishery. Uh, so there was a high-profile paper last year out of UBC that estimated for the period of 20, uh, 2000 to 2011, uh, Chinese distant water fisheries catch uh, was more than 10 times what was actually reported to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organisation, or the FAO. As this underreporting suggests, one of the key problems in assessing uh, the role of China in relation to global fisheries more generally uh, is the unreliability of official Chinese data. Uh, this unreliability is a well-known and long-standing problem and it's also been highlighted in relation to production statistics where China was shown to massively uh, overestimate production statistics. So for both the aquaculture and the distant water fishery, um, researcher called Tabitha Mallory is argued uh, that currently domestic employment and profits are the most important drivers of their development at the moment. So about half of the Chinese distant water fishery catch, for example, is currently exported overseas. So it's not necessarily uh, about food security per se. Uh, and so the basic picture is that as the government uh, has implemented strong measures uh, to limit wild uh, capture fisheries in domestic waters, uh, they're expanding into aquaculture and uh, distant water fisheries. That's just a... a a model or a diorama or whatever of a um, map of the world with all the different lights lit up um, where the Chinese distant water uh, fishery fleet goes and has agreements with various countries. Uh, in the Chinese fishery sector, it's mostly international environmental NGO NGOs that uh, dominate rather than local environmental NGOs. Uh, so there's been a lot of interest by international donor agencies uh, and NGOs. Um, which has been on the rise in recent years. So they've produced uh, a range of high-profile reports. They've held various industry forums with different fishery sectors and they've launched a range of consumer awareness campaigns. So two important areas that they've focused on in China has been uh, the introduction of certification and uh, domestic seafood consumption. So certification, for those who aren't as familiar with it, it's a market-based tool uh, that aims to shift consumer demand uh, towards more sustainable options. And it's being increasingly applied internationally. Uh, so globally, the Marine Stewardship Council, or the MSC, uh, is the most prominent sea seafood certification scheme. So Chinese uh, businesses, they see economic opportunities in going green, uh, and they worry about barriers to entry into certain export markets uh, for their products. So particularly Europe is a, uh, a very strong buyer of MSC seafood. So as a result, uh, the introduction of environmental certification has expanded uh, quite a lot in recent years. Uh, the MSC itself established an office in mainland China uh, last year, uh, and there's almost 300 businesses uh, that have MSC chain of custody certification, uh, and these businesses are primarily involved in the processing uh, and re-exporting of various types of salmon and whitefish. These businesses uh, have chain of custody certification, which is certification for the period of time uh, that the seafood is in their custody, but the actual fisheries themselves are not necessarily certified. Uh, and there's actually only one fishery in China, uh, a scallop fishery, which is currently under assessment uh, for certification 
uh, and just last week actually this particular fishery uh, was in the news for having sustained uh, massive losses. So this means uh, the key limitation of seafood certification to date in China is that it's overwhelmingly dominated by attention to fisheries produced uh, for the international export market and not the domestic Chinese market. And so this is the same problem identified earlier in relation to uh, standards for food safety and aquaculture in China. And so a large reason behind this dual system of seafood certification is the lack of a strong domestic market uh, for sustainable seafood within China. So to sum up in this part of the research, uh, we studied some of the key initiatives uh, and activities in the governance context for fisheries in China and what their implications for environmental sustainability are. In the form of state policy, uh, there's the development of a new range of regulations on fisheries management and sustainability uh, and an emphasis in state rhetoric of ensuring balance between increasing production uh, and environmental sustainability. Among donor agencies and civil society, there's been increasing levels of engagement uh, within China, uh, particularly in relation to the development of traceability and certification systems uh, and consumer awareness campaigns such as those related to shark and consumption, as I'll go into a bit more detail about later. Uh, but while all these all of these initiatives uh, remain marked by severe constraints. So state policy remains subject to the limitations of environmental governance more broadly uh, in China, and the voice of civil society in many ways uh, still remains quite heavily constrained by the state. Uh, their activities on fisheries in China are in the early stages of development uh, and still marked by notable limitations. Finally, uh, China's role in global fisheries is also a highly political question. Uh, so many of the problems that China is criticised for is uh, are merely local variants of practices uh, that are quite common across the globe, uh, including in developed countries. So, as we've seen in international climate change negotiations, uh, China's role in environmental sustainability is very closely linked uh, to the role of other richer economies as well. So we wrote this up and published this paper recently in Ocean and Coastal Management. Uh, another activity I was involved in earlier this year uh, on the theme of governance was a workshop organised by Stanford Centre uh, on food security and environment. So they held a workshop in May uh, in Peking University and it was intended uh, by a range of uh, international scientists and senior Chinese fishery scientists trying to bring them together. Um, and it was, yeah, the title as you can see was Fisheries and Food Security in China. Uh, and the goal of this working group is to work together on a range of publications and research projects in the future. So I'll shift now to the next element of my project, which is consumption itself. Uh, so China now consumes the largest amount of seafood uh, in the world, and much of this is, of course, again, due to the fact that China has the highest population in the world. So in particular, though, China's uh, the leading market for a number of forms of what often gets called as luxury seafood. So library food fish on the bottom there, uh, sea cucumbers and shark fin. So in terms of sheer quantities by uh, volume, these fisheries often aren't particularly large when you compare them to some of the big international tuna or the pollock fisheries, for example. Uh, but in terms of financial value, they're extremely significant. They're also very significant in <coughs> environmental terms because of the potential effects overfishing uh, of these types of seafoods in particular can have on ecosystems. Again, actual per capita consumption of seafood is still uh, lower than in many countries, uh, and this consumption is often of lower trophic level uh, or relatively environmentally friendly species. So carp, for example, is still the most popular fish uh, eaten in China, and tilapia is uh, one of the most prominent exports. Uh, so the point isn't to try and paint China uh, as a rapacious consumer, which is a negative uh, stereotype that you often get in the Western media, uh, but to challenge some of these stereotypes and understand uh, more clearly what uh, the actual implications of increasing seafood consumption are. Data is, again, uh, fishy, unclear, and there's different ways to measure seafood consumption. Um, there's doubts about how much exactly Chinese seafood consumption is increasing, uh, but it seems that it definitely is increasing, and this is part of a broader shift in food consumption patterns in China that includes a shift uh, to the greater consumption of meat. Uh, and the large factors that are contributing to this shift are essentially urbanisation and increased incomes. So just a quick note to clarify the different types of seafood imports into China and what type I've been focusing on. So first, there's a large amount of fish mostly salmon and white fish uh, that arrives in China from, say, North America or Russia. Uh, and then in China, it's processed, so filleted and packaged, uh, and then re-exported off to markets in Europe or back to North America. So I'm not talking about that. Uh, second, there's a large amount of fish meal that's imported into China, which is used to support the massive aquaculture industry. Uh, and again, I'm not focusing on that. And third is the focus of my research uh, so far, uh, which is 
the import of high value uh, or luxury seafood for domestic consumption. So shifting out of focus uh, on my research on luxury seafood consumption in Beijing. So one element of my research has focused on trying to get an understanding of consumer attitudes and consumer perspectives towards seafood consumption uh, and some of the social dynamics surrounding seafood consumption in China. So we interviewed a whole lot of uh, luxury seafood restaurant operators around Beijing uh, and we did follow up interviews over the last couple of years. Uh, Beijing is a particularly good site uh, to study luxury seafood consumption because it's the location of many of the, the government agencies uh, and the business headquarters. We transcribed uh, all of the interviews and then coded and analysed them for important themes that emerged uh, from the interviews. So most of the luxury seafood gets consumed in very uh, extravagant banquets and very significant social occasions and so some of these important dishes that need to be served uh, include lobster, gooey duck, crabs, abalone, um, shark fin, uh, sea cucumber. In Beijing, the postcopus uh, species are preferred, and actually most of these are actually domestically farmed in the northeastern provinces, but um, in southern China there's a lot more tropical sea cucumbers that are also consumed. Uh, and then reef fish. Uh, so, uh, Napoleon Rass is the most expensive, then the Barramundi Cod is the next most expensive, then the Leopard Coral Grouper, leopard coral grouper uh, and then other types of groupers. So apart from their taste and their beautiful appearance, a large uh, attraction of these sorts of fish is in fact their price. So if you order these fish, it's a way of showing your guests that you value them uh, and you honour them. Uh, so fish of between 500 to 700 grams are seen as the best quality. Uh, much bigger than that, and they're viewed as losing uh, tenderness. Apart from the reef fish, uh, tuna and salmon are also very popular, uh, prepared Japanese style, uh, and puffer fish uh, is also uh, becoming much more popular in banquets as well. Generally speaking, marine fish are preferred over freshwater fish, and freshwater fish are typically uh, viewed with a few exceptions as a bit more common and cheap. Much seafood is cooked in the Cantonese cuisine style of cooking, uh, which often involves just steaming the seafood and only very lightly cooking it. Uh, freshness is extremely important, and so uh, the importance of freshness is actually the main reason behind the development of the live reef fish for food trade, why the, the fish need to be transported live all the way to, to China. In terms of understanding some of the social drivers uh, of this sort of consumption, a key issue is that of the banquet culture. So Holding a big seafood banquet is a way of cementing social ties with important business or government partners, for example, uh, and often people who are in high-level positions in government or the private sector will attend uh, several banquets a week as part of their work obligations. During these banquets, hosts are expected to impress their guests uh, by serving very high-status foods, and so many of the sorts of seafood that I just described uh, are very high-status, partly because they're linked uh, with Cantonese cuisine, which is generally seen as a very high-status cuisine uh, across China. So internationally, although not necessarily within China, perhaps the most well-known seafood dish in these banquets is shark fin soup. And so what was interesting with shark fin soup was that almost all of the restaurant operators we interviewed uh, reported a significant decline in the consumption of shark fin. Uh, so it's been, the shark fin issue has been very heavily publicised in recent years with an environmentalist campaign uh, using former celebrity basketballer Yao Ming uh, as an advocate, as you can see in a billboard in Beijing there. Um, one of the things we wanted to look at in our interviews was the relative impact of this campaign. Uh, so while restaurant operators did agree that the campaign has definitely raised awareness of the shark fin issue among consumers, they were mixed in their views on how much <coughs> impact it has actually had uh, on actual consumption practices. So a more important reason that they gave uh, for the decline in shark fin consumption was actually the preponderance of fake uh, or synthetic shark fins on the market. So selling Synthetic shark fins using a, a simple sort of starch-based mixture uh, is very common. Um, it's meant that consumers uh, no longer trust to buy shark fin and have a high degree of cynicism about it now. And so again, trust in the food system more broadly in China is extremely low, uh, and again linking to the um, massive impact of the food safety scandals and crimes in recent years. So when we looked at sustainability and uh, traceability among seafood industry representatives. Um, there was generally a very low level of awareness uh, of these issues. Um, so customers and even managers and chefs uh, typically know very little around any of the issues surrounding library food fish, for example. So very, no, very few know where they're actually um, 
any of the issues surrounding live fish, such as um, where they're actually caught. Um, virtually none had heard about the use of cyanide to catch the fish, which I'll go into a little bit more detail about later. Uh, some were convinced that their coral trout was imported from uh, the USA, some from Canada, um, others that their Napoleon wrasse uh, came from Australia, uh, none of which is, is true. Uh, and very, people, very few people know much uh, beyond the next link in the market chain. Uh, so many may only know their direct buyer uh, and or seller. We had a lot of interviews where traders uh, or restaurant managers talked about this and so they suggested that not only did they not know where the fish came from a lot of the time, uh, even if they did know or advised a certain location, they don't trust it. So quotes there, um, one relates to restaurant managers buying from traders uh, and the other selling to consumers. So again, uh, this relates to the lack of trust uh, in broader institutions in Chinese society, which was a massive theme that came out from many of our interviews that we didn't necessarily anticipate originally. Uh, and connected with issues about food safety and bait shark fins uh, that I mentioned earlier. A recent development in China, though, is that there's been um, some policy developments which have had a big impact on seafood consumption. So with the new Xi Jinping administration, uh, they immediately launched a very strong crackdown against all forms of government access, and one of the specific targets was government banquets. And so that's a quote from the president there, essentially advising government officials to clean up their act. Uh, and this anti-corruption campaign has had a massive effect uh, on luxury uh, demand more broadly in China. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see how sustained um, that effect will be. And so there's been many reports that many of these luxury seafood restaurants have been struggling uh, the last couple of years. And again, not just luxury seafood, but luxury cars, luxury watches, jewellery and so on, have all taken significant hits. Uh, with this... Aspect of the project, we've had a range of papers come out this year. So one in Conservation and Society was a, a policy-oriented piece uh, that examined the environmental implications of these banquets uh, and discussed a range of policy options to possibly address this. Uh, the second in Asian anthropology focused more on uh, banquets as an interesting example that highlights the lack of trust uh, in institutions in contemporary Chinese society. So lack of trust in the food system uh, to provide them with safe and authentic food and lack of trust in the institutions of the economy and the rule of law uh, in professional working contexts, uh, which compels people to socialise and network at luxury seafood banquets. Uh, and the third paper was a smaller descriptive one that just uh, examined a range of new product forms for tropical sea cucumbers that are now being sold in China. There's also been a lot of media interest uh, in this aspect of my research, so I've had pieces that have been taken up and translated into Chinese language media. Uh, I've been interviewed by a range of industry and uh, general news sources. Um, I was asked to write a piece for The Conversation uh, on shark fin consumption, uh, and I was flown to Hong Kong uh, to be interviewed for a doco on seafood traceability, uh, which I think might be shown tonight, actually, I think. Um, and I think this media interest um, reflects public interest in what's a, a really important issue. So I'll shift now to talk about the third element of the project, so trade within China. Uh, and this has involved interviews with seafood traders across China to try and get an understanding of a range of uh, impacts uh, to do with tra trading patterns uh, or aspects uh, of trading patterns. Uh, and so these have looked at such as uh, things such as the relationships between uh, traders and governments, important characteristics or qualities of seafood in the Chinese market, such as sustainability, freshness, food safety, uh, the social relationships among suppliers uh, and more descriptive um, trying to figure out uh, trade routes and networks uh, for particularly important commodities. We're still in the very early stages uh, of doing this part of the research, so we've been able to work with some trading associations to do interviews in the major seafood market in Beijing, Jingshan Seafood Market. Uh, I've also been attending various uh, seafood trade shows uh, around the country in different places. Uh, which has given me a good opportunity to speak to a wide range of different international and national uh, businesses working on uh, seafood trade in China. So I shift now to talk about my work in the Philippines, and so this is focused on fisheries that are exported to China, uh, so it has focused essentially on one of the production elements of uh, the commodity chains that are exported to China. And so this part of my research builds on my earlier research in the Philippines where I did uh, research for my PhD. And this has involved uh, working in Tagalog. So two of the main characters I've been working with in the Philippines are pictured here. So Palawan State University. Um, Palawan's the province I've been working at mostly in the Philippines for many years. Uh, I work with Professor Michael Pito, 
He's a, actually a JCU PhD graduate from the 1990s. Uh, he used to be at World Fish or Iklam as it was called back then uh, for quite a few years before returning to Palawan. Uh, and on the left is Wolfram Dressler, uh, who's now based at the University of Melbourne. Uh, and he's actually going to be coming up to Townsville tomorrow for a few days. Uh, and the main project we're working on together now has been funded uh, under a discovery grant for the next three years. So talk about the example of the library fish for food trade in the Philippines as an export fishery to China. As a very quick introduction to the trade, the data is quite patchy again, but estimates are of approximately 30,000 tonnes per year, uh, worth about one US uh, billion dollars, uh, and about 60% of this goes to China and Hong Kong. But this hasn't been um, clarified in great detail for many years, uh, and the real figures are likely higher. Uh, as I indicated earlier, live fish uh, is an important component of seafood banquets there. Uh, the main species caught for the trade are the coral trout, um, barramundi cod, napoleon wrasse, uh, and a whole range of epinephalous species of groupers uh, that are generally quite a bit lower valued. Uh, you can see on the simple diagram there, so the trade goes through many different people before it finally gets to the consumer. So uh, the fishermen who will catch it uh, and then sell it on uh, either to a middleman or direct to a local trader. Often at this stage, they'll grow the fish out and fatten it up um, if it's not at a suitable size yet. Uh, from the local traders, the fish get transported to an exporter uh, based in Manila, uh, and then it usually goes to an importer in Hong Kong, who then sells it further on to importers in mainland China, who then sell it on to restaurants and uh, hotels, who then serve the fish at banquets. And at each stage of the chain, uh, the price rises, obviously, so that everyone's able to make a profit. This slide, again, quite dated, um, but shows the major trade routes uh, of the live fish trade. So basically the major exporters that together comprise virtually all of the supply, the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Australia is actually a significant uh, exporter as well. There is sporadic trading in other parts uh, of the Pacific, for example, but uh, the big exporting countries are those, basically. <coughs> so just to clarify all the, the arrows going, everything goes, or almost everything goes into Hong Kong first because of the uh, much lower tariffs and then gets re-exported on into China. Okay, so just to give you a sense of... Um, get a break from my voice for a couple of seconds. This is just a video of uh, loading fish in uh, the southern Philippines where I worked, so often um, once the fish are caught they'll be plonked in a uh, a floating fish cage um, a few hundred metres out to sea and then the big boats uh, will come um, and once they've got enough fish uh, they scoop them all up together um, and then weigh them and then plonk them on the boat. Uh, oops. We don't have sound but it's a... Uh, oh, okay. Might work. I don't know. Check. No, that's, ah, that's alright. It's the sound of an engine. Use it on the laptop, mate. Oh. Oh. Where is it? Up oh, there. impacts with the live fish trade that have been very well documented uh, by quite a lot of people. So firstly is the simple problem uh, of overfishing. And so the fish that are targeted by the trade are considered to be generally fairly long-lived uh, and slow to reproduce, which means that they're vulnerable to fishing pressure. Uh, and this has been seen uh, especially with uh, the Napoleon wrasse, uh, 
uh, which is shown to decline very rapidly, basically, uh, wherever it's fish and is now considered endangered. Uh, and there's a few specific practices to trade that are part of the overfishing issue. So fishermen often target spawning aggregations, uh, which obviously has an impact on fish populations. Uh, the trade you probably know for is so for the use of cyanide uh, to catch the fish. So a tablet of cyanide is dissolved in a bottle of water, um, which is then squirted by the diver um, into the coral that stuns the fish. Uh, and then while they're stunned, they're scooped up and revived um, once they're back on the surface. Uh, so this is a much more efficient method than hook and line, so it contributes significantly to fishing pressure, uh, and it also has effect, effects on the coral reefs as well. Another specific uh, aspect of Chinese consumption of these reef fish is that they're preferred as plate-sized fish. So as I mentioned, 500 to 700 grams is considered uh, tasty and tender. Uh, and so especially for larger reef fish like Napoleon wrasse, for example, uh, the fish that are caught are usually quite young uh, and immature uh, and very Juvenile fish are also caught as well, so um, like this one here, uh, where they're placed in grow-out cages until they reach a, a marketable size. Talking to fishermen, you get a very good idea of what the catch trends are, and the perceptions of fishermen uh, are generally that you have to fish further distances and for longer periods of time than previously, uh, and the average size of the fish is declining. So uh, in the table here, the numbers of fishermen who feel this way, um, this is based on a questionnaire we did in the southern Philippines, um, about 60% feel that they're fishing for a longer period of time than five years previously. 70% uh, feel that their fish catch of coral trout is declining. Uh, and over 70% of people think that the average size of the actual fish has declined. So these are a variety of different indicators of overfishing, uh, which complements a lot of other biological data from other parts of Palawan as well. So there's been a, a lot of ecologists and uh, fisheries uh, experts have actually uh, got a lot more um, biological data on these issues as well. There's also health issues uh, such as decompression sickness, which is fairly common uh, among many of the divers. Uh, fishers also have to be careful when they fish not to uh, poison themselves with the needles that they use to puncture the swim bladder of the fish. Uh, and so they often use disposed needles uh, from health clinics. Uh, so that's a whole container there of bloody needles, uh, which are being sold uh, at the local general store in a village I was working at in the southern Philippines. Uh, and there's also many people written about uh, the economic distribution of benefits of the trade. Uh, and so a lot of people have argued that the trade is skewed and structured in a way that it benefits the larger traders uh, and doesn't financially benefit the smaller fishermen as much. It's not a simple issue though, and so while the trade uh, in Southeast Asia often gets demonised by many people, uh, it is a very important livelihood uh, for many people in coastal parts of Southeast Asia. So talking to fishermen, uh, again based on the same questionnaire we did, the environmental issues are not necessarily the most important issue uh, or even the most, uh, or even particularly important when you compare them to issues such as healthcare. So this was an assessment uh, of community level problems that we identified in our field work in southern Palawan uh, and how concerns about fisheries declines are much lower uh, than, the, than these other livelihood concerns. Uh, so basically healthcare uh, and a lack of livelihood opportunities were nominated far and away as the most significant problem facing people in the area. Uh, and fisheries issues rank much lower down the list behind other issues such as water quality, uh, a lack of electricity, food security uh, and educational opportunities. So in parts of Palawan and Southeast Asia at least, uh, fisheries such as the trade in live fish are often operating uh, in the context of high poverty. So in much of the region there's very limited opportunities for viable alternative livelihoods. Uh, in many islands of Palawan for example there's uh, little or no agricultural possibilities. So from this perspective, the trade uh, in live fish has been uh, a very important economic stimulus to local communities uh, relative to where they were previously. Many households have been able to improve their standard of living uh, from subsistence level only to be able to invest in things such as a basic education for their children, uh, some degree of health care uh, and material goods that have resulted uh, in an improved standard of living. So again, while the trade often gets a very bad reputation, uh, especially among those who work in conservation, uh, because of its very serious environmental impacts, it is uh, massively important for local communities in the context uh, when there aren't many other pathways to a reasonable quality of life. So just as a tangential aside, uh, I've also been doing more recent research with seafood firms from a range of developed countries, so attending seafood expos, doing interviews, uh, accessing national trade statistics and so on. Uh, the basic picture that's emerging here uh, is a rapidly increasing seafood trade with China. Uh, and in recent years, China's offered an especially promising market uh, in comparison to other markets, such as those in Europe, 
So just as an example, there's a, a graph showing US lobster exports to China, uh, which is using very fast, as you can see. Uh, there was a representative of the provinces of New Brunswick in Canada, uh, which told me that in one year they had a 970% increase in a single year in their exports of lobster to China. So this just sort of highlights the scale and pace uh, of what's going on with certain commodities. So that's something I'm interested in looking at uh, in more detail in the future, if possible. So summing up for this production bit, I've described briefly some of the regional scale consequences uh, associated with Chinese consumption of luxury seafood. So in the Philippines uh, and parts of the Philippines, uh, Chinese consumption is clearly a direct driver of stock declines uh, and ecological problems uh, with the live fish trade. From a political economy perspective as well, while at the local scale, uh, the trade is a very important livelihood, uh, the fishers who are engaged in the trade aren't exactly bargaining from a position of strength. So credit is frequently extended <coughs> from investors all the way from Hong Kong, uh, and this credit extension combined with the fact that fishers are often in a situation of fairly high poverty uh, with few alternative livelihoods and they don't have a great deal of control uh, over pricing arrangements. So in terms of policy implications, uh, we've argued that actors in developing countries such as the Philippines would do well uh, to perhaps try and explicitly plan for how they're going to deal with increasing demand from China for seafood and other natural resources. Uh, we argue that export fisheries to China clearly do have the capacity to generate significant levels of economic and social benefits uh, throughout the region at both national and local scales. But currently, despite these opportunities, uh, many of these fisheries are failing to generate these benefits in environmentally sustainable or socially equitable manners. So we've had a paper come out recently in development policy review that focuses uh, on the library fish for food trade and implications for local communities in the Philippines. Uh, it was also recently commissioned by WWF Coral Triangle uh, to write a policy report for them focusing on the livelihood implications uh, of Chinese seafood consumption for the Coral Triangle. So this used the case studies of live reef fish for food trade in Southeast Asia and the sea cucumber fishery from Papua New Guinea. Uh, as I mentioned, we obtained an ARC discovery grant to continue work on this research from 2014 to 2016. Uh, so more recently, in August and September, I spent about five weeks in the Philippines uh, beginning and getting the ball rolling with this project. Uh, and so this explicitly uh, focuses on the topic of how different people in coastal communities in the Philippines um, are able to access the benefits of fishery trade uh, and some of the trade-offs between social and ecological costs and benefits. So shifting now to quickly uh, outline some of the plans I've got for the future three years of the fellowship, um, continuing following the, the four themes of uh, governance, consumption, trade and production. So in terms of governance, I'll be continuing to work with the Fisheries and Food Security Working Group uh, and we hope to write a paper together uh, and to submit a proposal for joint research together. On consumption, uh, we've managed to secure funding from the World Wildlife Fund uh, in China to help us do a survey of Chinese seafood consumers and supermarkets in Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, and so this will look at not only the, the luxury seafood consumption that I've focused on uh, in restaurants and so far, but more everyday fish consumption that's undertaken by Chinese seafood consumers. So we're interested, for example, in the transition of consumption practices from buying fish at local wet markets in China to more and more frozen fish in supermarkets. Uh, on the theme of trade, uh, we've got ongoing interviews in Beijing. Um, we need to analyse a lot of the interviews that we've already done. Uh, I'll also be participating in a study funded by Packard uh, to try and identify options for improved governance of sea cucumber trade routes uh, from PNG to China, uh, and that's being led by Kate Parker at UTS. In terms of production in the Philippines, as I mentioned, uh, we're successful with our discovery application. So this is going to involve a lot more field work uh, in 2015 and 2016. Uh, and then finally, from next April, uh, I'll be physically moving to Penang, Malaysia, uh, to be affiliated with World Fish. Uh, and there, uh, I'm aiming to develop a range of collaborations with researchers there uh, who work on value chains, fish trade, uh, and governance. And so, I'll leave it there with some words of thanks to the ARC Centre and my major collaborators, and uh, of course, the Society in Science Franco Rice Fellowship. Thanks. Tasmanian giant crab there, the Shooter Carcinus gigas, which I wrote the stock assessment 
Yeah, that, that trade, there was a big clampdown on that. Um, which almost shut down the entire Southern Rock lobster industry yeah. a few years back. I mean, is that is that legal? Is that what? How? What's the relationship between the low tariff entry into China and the Chinese law? I guess. Yeah, it's a it's a very murky grey zone, and uh, you talk to traders uh, outside of China, and they will say uh, it's not up to us. We just do it. We just sell the products that um, the way that our Chinese buyers want to buy it, and they want to buy it from us in Hong Kong, mm. uh, in directly mainland China. And so once, once it goes to Hong Kong, it's none of our business. And so um, there has been recent, yeah, on and off part, um, clampdowns on the trade, as you mentioned that one a couple of years ago, that uh, shut down the rock lobs the fishery just before Christmas one time. But um, it's going to be very interesting to see with this free trade agreement with Australia, um, yeah, if and when it gets announced in the next couple of weeks, what's the implications uh, for that going to be? But interestingly, talking to some uh, traders from New Zealand, for example, they say, because um, New Zealand have had a free trade agreement with China for several years now, they say that even though they have uh, the supposed free trade direct to China now, uh, they still go through Hong Kong because just the trading networks and infrastructure and routes are just so well set up uh, through Hong Kong that it's still beneficial uh, to go through Hong Kong, but it's certainly a, a great degree of, adds a good degree of uncertainty and possibly vulnerability to um, um, the activities of, of fishermen. Right. The, I'm fairly ignorant of all this, but uh, have the, has the live fish trade had an impact on NPAs in the Philippines? Uh, that's probably something Vera uh, or Rebecca, I don't know, yeah, um, might have a, a better answer to. But as far as I understand it, NPAs in the Philippines have not typically tended to um, be developed in response to live fish trade activities. There was in Palawan, I know, when they were talking about a management plan uh, for the live fish trade over the last few years, it's, it's still ongoing. Uh, MPAs were part of that. They were trying to locate spawning aggregation sites, for example, um, of groupers and to include those zones um, within MPAs. But I don't think the live fish trade is a major driver of MPA development in the Philippines. I was thinking of the reverse. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. With the sustainability of China, big question mark. But if you see the trade from the US and the increase, their capacity actually and how sustainable do they produce the food. I mean this is a reaction economic driven making money, right? Mm. Uh, are they following certain guidelines? And because I cannot imagine that they have so much capacity for the production of let's say what was it? I don't know the increase, right? But the slope is so steep that yeah. they grow up. Uh, I mean I think it's fair to say that overall uh, management systems in North America are generally quite a bit more uh, sophisticated and well regulated uh, than in parts of the Philippines that I've focused on. Uh, certainly, so that, that was the area which was completely overcatched as a disaster if you look at the coastline of Newfoundland yeah. and probably Newfoundland. Yeah, okay. for, for that was, I mean, yeah. this area was best before anyone considered any like, yeah, the yeah. long term programs. Yeah. Um, but having said that, there, um, I think there was a, yeah, a paper discussing the other day, Simon, the, the Gilded Trap. Um, I don't know, I can't remember the, the details of the paper, but I think it was suggesting basically that um, they've managed to yeah, massively increase production uh, of lobsters, uh, yeah. but um, it's potentially quite vulnerable um, and they don't have, um, yeah, I don't know, data. So, yeah, basically, the fishery is feeding itself. So it's like a big aquifer open that yeah, open, so, open water so, aquifer. So the bait that they're putting in the water is yeah. is massively increasing the productivity of the fishery. Mm. And it's just this big rolling ball that's getting bigger and bigger and it has to bust at some point. But at the moment they just keep extracting it, it just keeps getting bigger. It's yeah. just a bizarre system. Yeah, Mike, well maybe you tell us something about how um, the library uh, uh, fish trade got so focused on groupers. There's plenty of other, you know, there's one species of um, uh, brass 
in there that you mm. talked about at least. There's plenty of other colourful, tasty reef fish that's got much more sustainable fast life histories. Yeah. Which might, you know, and you know, there's lots of the rabbit, there's lots of herbivores, which presumably would be easy to transport, easy to keep alive, and probably more sustainable. So why is there such a focus on this upper trophic level uh, group? Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good question. Um and it's something that I've often wondered about. Why are you also fixated on this one coral trout and stuff? And uh, you see other uh, beautiful red reef fish, like um, I'm not sure the common name here, but you've got the coral hind, um, like beautiful bright red as well. Um, and to me, it looks just as beautiful. But it's like well, you say, again, well, yeah, but, but just as an example of a, another type of fish. That are, yeah. You know, in front of the group, one of the, of the groups, there's a lot of the other fish, and they're, they're at the top of the food web. Mm. So they're, in terms of getting energy and, and uh, productivity through the reef ecosystem, mm. it's a very inefficient family to be eating. Yeah. So, you know, it's the same as, you know, we don't eat predators on land, you know, we eat sheep that eat, you know, we eat the bottom of the, of the food web. So I just wonder whether, you know, you know how that developed in the first place. Southern China, it was sort of originally developed around Hong Kong, and so the, the types of reef fish that were caught around um, Hong Kong before it expanded massively into Southeast Asia. And so, um, I mean, you talk to people and they say, well, it's because they're the most beautiful, uh, and so on. Um, but as I was just using the example of the coral hind, even as it, as it is, a, even if it is another grouper, it's like that is uh, considered as schmack, you know. <laughs> but it's hard. To me, I don't really notice the difference. And, yeah. and then it's yeah. you know, shifting the choice. Yeah, but it's how how are they going to get the food from the coral hind? Uh, in, in China, how long, when, when did it actually start? In like southern China, around Hong Kong, it's been going on for many, many, many years. Yes, the expansion of the, but the expansion of the trade has only started I since. How, how it started, what, what, why it started in that, yeah. in that group. And maybe it's because the fishing gears are using much more trash in or I don't know. Yeah. But it's just, it's just quite interesting that they've got such a focus on such an unsustainable group of fish. Yeah. 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 Mark, just linked to that. Um, well, if it's a cultural uh, reason for that, um, do you look also at the history of fishing? And also, as a non-native speaker, I'm worried about also uh, how do you deal with local naming of fish? Because that's the same in Russia, for instance. It's the same in China. Every region has a different name for the same fish. Yeah. So you're talking about the English names, but then you have to go to the Latin names, but then you have to go to the Chinese names. Are you planning to link all that? Because that's the main problem in the seafood traceability or traceability in general, as long as I'm a molecular biologist and I'm able to do that, you don't have the genetics behind it, then you have a problem to really know a species name, so not, not having vultures. Are you working with whatever MAC or whatever institution doing this kind of background poacher, molecular stuff, just to be sure about the name and when somebody tells you this is this fish and it's a processed product, how do you know it's the correct one? Yeah. Um well, with live reef fish, for example, I don't generally deal with uh, processed products, obviously. Um, and yes, yeah, I'm, I, I have no formal marine biological training, but I think I, I know. It's taxonomical almost. But I know, I think I know more about, yeah, I know the name for Petrotoponus leopardus in about 17 different dialects now. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's, that's the important thing. Yeah. That's the main issue, I think. So many different names, so many different. No, and where I work in Southern Palau. I mean, Carl is like the most used name ever in the yeah. world. Like, it's crazy. But it's, it's the same as the cultural and the history of fishing. Yeah. There is a reason why people start to fish a species, and then when it's gone, uh, they don't know what to do. I mean, they don't just change, like, well, this one is also good. Especially in the Chinese, very strong culture, I assume that's like, well, this is that fish, and that's because of that, and that's the status. If you give that fish to your boss or to yeah. your colleagues, something else. That's, that's no, and it's interesting in Philippines as well because you'll get uh, Petrobonus leopardus, for example, that will change colour um, 
based on how long it's uh, been fattened up or and what conditions it's been fattened up in and stuff. And so they change price as a result of that. And they actually have different names uh, for the same species, but just in different stages and so on. So you, do, you should do epigenetics also. Mm. Yeah, well, hopefully we can talk about that next week. Yeah. I think we've got time for one more question here. Thanks. Yeah, you. Hey, man. Yeah. Hi. Um, so what do you think the, the possible future, I mean, the, the direction of what the Chinese uh, see for the consumption? As you mentioned, that the, the, the China has about 420 years history of always uh, see for the consumption. It's kind of embedded in their culture. So you can't easily, uh, I mean, you also mentioned that the, the, the consumption per capita is still relatively low. So even a little bit increase will the, the whole amount, because the population is big, so the whole consumption will be very, very huge. Mm. So, I mean, you can't change the, the, the culture part in a very short time period. Mm. That means in the future, I mean, for sustainable future, I can still see the demand of the consumption is still very high about this, I mean, the luxury seafood or the general seafood. Mm. So, I mean, what's the, the implication of the? Yeah, well, I guess a lot of people tend to say, um, it's cultural, therefore you can't do anything, sort of thing. But I think what I've heard is sort of, yeah, yeah, but the interesting thing with a lot of this luxury seafood is that even though in um, it may have been common in southern China for many years, it actually hasn't been that common in northern China, for example. It's only really developed since the 1980s, uh, since the expansion of the economy. And so shark fin, for example, used to only be found in major southern cities. Now it's all around China. Uh, and so it's an amazing part of China. Actually, there, that part is the, the sea for the consumption is mainly based on the coast area of China. Yeah. The east part, south east part. But, but not for the It's only way. maybe 40% of the population. Another huge amount of people, they didn't eat too much about the, this kind of stuff. So mm. it's, uh, yeah, it, I mean, they, as you said, they go spread to the inner part of China. It's, it's big. But how can you, I mean, no, so my point there was trying to say that it's a, it's a dynamic social practice that's, that is subject to change. It's not necessarily some fixed uh, thing that people will be eating reef fish and shark fin forever. Uh, and so we've seen with shark fin, for example, there's many reasons why it may have changed and no one is exactly sure of exactly the reasons why it's changing. But what is quite clear is that it has uh, declined and not just from my own research, but in research of others. Uh, as well as indicating that consumption is significantly declining. So there's one sort of example of how things might be able to change. I mean, and then there's, if you look at the big picture, there's other strengths in Chinese seafood consumption as well in terms of, as I mentioned, carp is uh, extremely popular. Um, seaweed, you know, these are things that in Western countries we don't eat very often, um, but we would do well to, to learn from China yeah, in some of those things as well. Um, China is also a world leader in aquaculture, not just in terms of scale. But um, I was at a, this fisheries and food security workshop I was at earlier in the year had some fascinating presentations on new techniques um, for sustainable aquaculture in China. Um, obviously, massive challenges, but these are just sort of points of uh, you know, interesting things that are going on possibly. But you said at the beginning of your talk that somebody actually stepped out because your work is too critical and is too close governmentally. Mm. Where is the critical part? Where is the most sensitive part? Because from what you presented here, I don't see a significant you know, interference because you have very valuable information. Well, I'm, I don't see it as particularly <laughs> nasty or critical. Where, but do you see most offensive you know, reactions that you are not fitting in the program? Well, the fact that I'm suggesting that responsibility or environmental problems lies with China. Uh, is, uh, you know, it's something like that. I mean, I, I gave my first conference presentation in Chinese at a Chinese conference on this issue, and uh, I perhaps made a mistake. It was, a, it was an anthropological uh, conference, and I was roundly accused of Orientalism, which is basically the gravest insult uh, you, can, you can give as an anthropologist to say that you ignore the culture of other people. And it was basically suggesting that I'm just focusing on China um, 
you know, bad in China, ignoring Japan, for example, because they're much more horrible than China. Yeah, so I think any any time foreigners come in and suggest that China needs to do something, you've got to be pretty careful about how you say it. Nice political note. I think we'll just thank Mike again. Thank you.